by way of introduction. So um, I'll say this for you since you always say it yourself. Like after a very inauspicious start as a Teach for America <laughs> Corps member, where I'm afraid our you know, then program director or whatever we called them attempted to counsel him out of the classroom. Um, he became one of our most incredible teachers. And in fact, um, I don't know if I've ever said this directly, but you probably know it. I mean, I spent a week with Dave around our 10th year at Teach for America, and it was kind of a revolutionary week for me. I mean, it just led me to a whole different level of understanding about the impact that our teachers could have and that we could have in this work. Um, he co-founded KIPP, which anyone here in the US knows has had a quite extraordinary impact. Um, they have now 162 KIPP schools um, across many, many urban and rural communities and have really shown people what is possible for kids um, as well as, you know, while at the same time truly you know, putting a whole bunch of kids on a, on a trajectory to much greater life opportunity. Um, and his work around character uh, has attracted just incredible interest um, in this country and actually all around the world. I don't even know how much you realize this and, and hugely across the Teach for All network. Um, so I will get started and, and just ask a few questions, um, but we really want you all to engage and obviously anyone here in person can um, pipe up and ask a question at any moment. And anyone watching online, um, use Twitter. I'm at, at Wendy Kopp. Dave is at Dave underscore Kip. Um, and we're using the TFAL Talks hashtag. And you can also email Naran Khan um, at teachforall.org. Um, so, Dave, let's so just go way back. And, okay. Um, <laughs> How far back? Um, Why did you join Teach for America? in the first place? Um, so there are a bunch of reasons I joined uh, Teach for America. So uh, in college, I got sort of really interested in studying um, American social history, history of education, uh, you know, ended up doing a lot of research and work in the Sea Islands off South Carolina about sort of what happened at the end of the Civil War and how, you know, a lot of public schools got started. Um, and so I went to my advisor and I, I said to her, and she was the head of teacher prep, but I didn't do teacher prep. Uh, and she, I was like, oh, you know, I want to go into public policy. And she was like this sort of very old, sort of very sort of stereotypical, like Professor Cratchity woman. I loved her to death, I still do. And she said, you don't know shit about public policy. Go do something real with your life. I'm like, oh, okay, like, uh, what do you mean? She's like, well, you'd be a really good teacher. I'm like, yeah, but I'm, <laughs> how am I going to become a teacher? And so then I, I found out about Teach for America, I've made the deadline and applied. <laughs> As you said, it wasn't like the smoothest beginning ever. Uh, in other words, I was like a horrible teacher. Um, I was a horrible, I was a great teacher for the first three days. And then day four, everything went like precipitously downhill. Um, but I was blessed to meet a woman by the name of Harriet Ball, uh, who was like one of the greatest teachers ever. And she took me under her wing and things got better. And here we are, 22 years later, however long. Um. Where did, so, so but, but take us beyond that first year then. I mean, how did things progress with your teaching and, and kind of where, where did KIPP come from? Yeah, so um, in the, in the it, it just, KIPP sort of started in, 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 so Mike Feinberg and I were both TFA core members. Uh, we were the second TFA core in Houston uh, when Houston had like the Houston Proud bumper sticker thing going. Uh, and we, 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 we shared an apartment, and he was teaching on the north side, I was teaching on the south side, uh, and we would come home and compare notes about what was going on in our classrooms. And like any first year teacher, your sort of your first sort of uh, obsession is just sort of trying to establish some sense of order in the class. Um, and you realize that the academic work and the character work about why anyone would care about the academic work and how do they, people demonstrate uh, those, those habits of, 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 of mind and of, of personal habits. So that stuff was there right from the very beginning. Uh, and we were so bad that we were like, there's not enough time in the day to teach the kids, right? So we said, well, why don't you guys come earlier so that we could even 
fuss at you more to be quiet, right? It was like, it was that bad. But anyhow, our kids ended up coming early, which was shocking to everyone in the school. We said, well, why don't you come, you know, a half hour early at 7.30? And like, no one's gonna come. And the kids all showed up. We're like, oh, why would they show up? Because they wanted to be in school. And then we said, well, why don't you guys stay late? And we'll do some math and we'll read and we'll play some games and they stayed late. And so we were running in our school classrooms. We were keeping the kids from 7.30 to five. Uh, and then we realized, wait a minute, like the kids were totally into it and we could establish it sort of as a program. We could really figure out how to put all these pieces together. And so in our second year, we started, Mike was on, in one school, I was in a separate school, and we started doing KIPP without a name in our classrooms. And then we said, well, what if we combined it um, and put all the kids in one room uh, and taught together? And that's what we did. And then we needed a name because um, we wanted to make a t-shirt. And I mean, really, this is how the whole thing began. Like, it's not glorious. Like, okay, we want to have a, like a uniform for the kids, therefore we need a name. Uh, and one of Harriet's song was Knowledge is Power. The more you read, the more you know. Knowledge is power, power is freedom, and I want it. And so we're like, Knowledge is Power is a good name. And so we said Knowledge is Power program. We put Kip on the, the front, and like, it just stuck. It was a nice name. It was funny because one of our early sort of critics said, all you did was give your classroom a name. And, and we were like, but it's a good name. And so it was like, <laughs> yeah, that's how it started. Um, and what would you say are the most important ways in which KIPP has evolved over time? So, um, you know, I, I think, one, you know, KIPP grew from a classroom of 45 kids to, as you said, 162 schools with almost 60,000 kids today, and we're still growing, and, and we have an amazing group of, of we call them uh, Fisher Fellows, who, who are going to be opening up our next a uh, set of schools, we're always looking for new folks to expand, uh, so we're trying to build out our K-12 pipeline. And I think that's sort of the biggest way that KIPP has changed. And so uh, when we started, we started fifth grade because we were fifth grade teachers, uh, and also because that was sort of the, the middle point between elementary school and middle school. Uh, and as everyone knows, middle school is sort of like the vast wasteland of American public education. Uh, and so when Mike, we were 24 and 23, and so we were middle school teachers. We saw how dysfunctional middle school was, and no one was going to let us start with kindergarten kids then, because that idea didn't exist. But they were like, well, look, it can't be worse at middle school. But now we serve kids pre-K through 12th grade. We run a program called KIPP Through College, which supports our alums to and through college. We've more than quadrupled the college graduation rate for low-income kids in this country. We've exceeded the national average for all demographic groups. Um, and we're, not e we're, 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 we're just over halfway towards our goal of having 75% of our kids earn a college degree and 100% of, uh, of our kids be uh, prepared for meaningful careers. And, and how do you think that that has shifted things to start now with three-year-olds? You're starting with three-year-olds, right? Yeah, where we can, wherever yeah. the law allows. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, I think, you know... Uh, like, has it changed your approach as well as... I mean, clearly, okay, now you can start earlier and, and such. Right, but yes. So, I mean, a couple of things. Uh, Three-year-olds can't go to school from 7.30 to 5. Uh, it's too long of a day. Um, but I think so much of the way... So, middle school, fifth and sixth grade are sort of your, you, you know... Think of them like the fourth quarter. I mean, I'm sorry, that football, the, I know this isn't going to play well overseas. Well, everyone watches, a lot of people watch the Super Bowl now. But, like, think of it like that, that fourth, you know, the fourth quarter of a game, right? And, like, you have all this ground to catch up. Because if kids go to high school behind, uh, I mean, 10th grade uh, here in the United States is sort of the demarcation line. If you are behind by the end of 10th grade, the, your chances of sort of completing college uh, are, are close to zero. Uh, without like massive intervention. And if you're behind in eighth grade, I mean, it's just, so everything we did had to be accelerated because you had fifth graders coming in who didn't know how to read, who didn't know their basic math skills, uh, who really didn't have a sense of school or what college could be. If you start with kids at three, uh, you know, you have a, a totally different trajectory. So our kids who uh, enter our middle schools now, we have second graders performing where our entering fifth graders used to be. So kids in our elementary school who are completing second grade are performing where our fifth graders. So it's, it's, you're, you're, you're really able to, to shift the, the life outcomes for those kids. And we're seeing that play out all through, through the pipeline. And has that affected the way you think about like, how to spend the school day? Like, so now, like these kids who started when they were three, when they're in fourth grade versus yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, you don't need to do, I if kids are reading uh, on level by fourth and fifth grade, you don't need twice the extra time for reading to catch kids up. At the same time, you know, um, we were blessed to meet Don and Doris Fisher, who are the co-founders of The Gap, who were sort of the first people to believe that we could uh, expand KIPP beyond the original two schools and who have been amazing partners ever since in, 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 our, in our growth and their family. Uh, and, you know, Don always used to talk about the fact like, well, when the elementary schools grow up, we could stop school at 3 o'clock, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, and, and the reality is no, because there's so much rich stuff that you can do with kids uh, around, you know, music and sports and deeper type of, you know, robotics, all the stuff that's going on. And also, quite frankly, in the neighborhoods in which KIPP schools uh, are located, uh, almost 90% of our kids are on free and reduced lunch. Uh, we're in some of the, the, the most challenging mm -hmm. neighborhoods in the country along, you know, basically where lots and lots of TFA core members are as well. Uh, the after school activities are not like uh, abundant, yeah. right? And, and, and so that's sort of an essential part of sort of, uh, of keeping kids uh, safe and, and meaningfully engaged. Mm -hmm. and, and where did the character work come from? So, uh, I mean, I know you have kids, I know you have four of them and, you know, anyone who has kids or you know, works with kids, people are like, well, how did you guys come up with like, the idea of like, be nice or work hard or like self-control? Like, we were fifth grade teachers. I don't know how many teachers are here. I don't know how many teachers are out there. But it, if you listen to the stuff you say to kids every day, right? So like, think about the number of times you say like, be nice to each other or stop talking or sit down or, you know, don't poke that kid with your pencil. Like, so if you think about that last group, don't poke the kid with the pencil, stop talking, sit down, all the stuff that teachers do on a regular basis or we do with our own kids, right? Like I have two boys, so it's like, don't put your brother in a headlock, right? No, you can't, you can't throw that book at him, right? All of that's related to self-control, right? So we didn't know the science behind it in, in 95. We didn't know uh, there was, you know, and, and there was a, gro you know, the science has grown up in the same time frame, really, in the last 20 years. But we knew from actual experience with kids that the, the non-academic skills, the, what we've come to call character skills, uh, were just as important. Not more important, but not less important, because they, they're, 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 they're like DNA. They're like, they go hand in hand, right? You, in order to learn, you actually have to sit and engage, right? And, and, and so like, people are all excited about the digital world in the future. But you still can actually sit and engage. Like, it's not like we're not yet going to have, like, it's not like, you know, the Borg where they're going to plug in the back or the Matrix. That's not, we're not there yet. So you actually have to still sit, engage, and want to want, want, want to learn. Yeah. And, and so what is the Character Lab doing? So, yeah, so the Character Lab, um, in, 90, in 2004, five, uh, you know, Mike and I reached out to, to Marty Seligman. Uh, who was at the University of Pennsylvania, and we wanted to learn more about his research on uh, sort of learned optimism uh, and on sort of the how, how kids make choices. And we ended up meeting, um, we met there uh, Angela Duckworth, uh, who is now one of the world's leading experts in grit and self-control, self as well as Dominic Randolph, who at the time was the assistant head at Lawrenceville, which is a private school, and now he's the head of school at, at Riverdale. And Angela, Dominic, and I started working on this question about how do you bridge the world of scientific research that's happening at the university level with K-12 practice and parenting around kids where it's like, you know, without science, everyone's still trying to get kids to have self-control, right? You're still trying to make kids grittier. Uh, if you think about grit in the simplest way of as, as an amalgamation of like persistence and resilience, right? So the ability to keep going and the ability to get back up when you get knocked down, it's like the sort of the simplest thinking of it. Uh, and goal orientation and all of that. That's what we, all of us want for, you know, I want that for my own two boys, you want it for your, your, the classrooms. And so, you know, we did that for, I guess, 2004, 2005. So we probably did that for seven, eight, nine years, uh, eight years. And then two years ago, we were like, you know what? We should help start an organization designed to bridge this world of research and, and K-12 education, which led to the Character Lab, mm -hmm. whose goal is to bridge that world, but in three major regards. So like to develop new research around these character skills. So how do we get kids to be grittier? Or how do you help kids develop self-control or social intelligence or curiosity? Or, you know, all the things that any, you know, people want for, for children. Uh, how do you disseminate the stuff that already exists? Because science knows stuff, but no, you know, the rest of us don't know it. And then how do you support 
uh, you know, teachers uh, and ultimately parents as well, but our main focus right now are on teachers and school leaders, how do you support them with the implementation of it? So to develop, disseminate, and support the implementation. And we're, we're two years in and very, very surprised at the sort of the inundated response uh, because we've struck a chord because like teachers know, like anyone who's been a teacher or spends any time with kids knows that like you're working on this stuff yeah. every minute of every day. And, and, and are there early learnings from the Character Lab? Yeah, I mean, so, I mean, there, there, there are, uh, you know, two very inspiring early learnings and two very real uh, early challenges. So w one of the inspiring things is that you can actually get, it's amazing when you put world-class researchers with world-class educators, they can come up with some really cool stuff. Yeah. Uh, and you can really start to see that you could bridge these, you know, here to for, totally separate worlds. Yeah. Uh, we've also, there's a body of research around, uh, it doesn't have like the sexiest name in the world yet, uh, but uh, mental contrasting with implementation intentions, also known as, <laughs> as I said, <laughs> right? <laughs> I, it, 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 known as MCII. Uh, the, it, for short, it's become WHOOP, which is a little bit more <laughs> sticky. Uh, and, um, but there, we're, we're starting to see that uh, and that's the research of Gabrielle Ottingen and, and Peter Goldwitzer at, uh, at NYU. Uh, and Angela has been partnering with them to see, it's, it's one, it has the largest research base of proven sort of goal setting and commitment fidelity. Mm -hmm. So how do you, how do you create that uh, has been huge. We, the third thing, uh, we ran a online course, a MOOC last year that has since been seen by almost 70,000 people. We have 1,200 schools right now trying to implement a professional development thing around it. And so like those are really yeah. some really inspiring early things. We had 258 teachers. Apply. So it's really yeah. cool stuff. The biggest challenge. Wait, OK, wait. Before you get to biggest challenge, what is WHOOP again? So WHOOP is an acronym uh, for mental contrasting with implementation intention. And if we had 15 minutes, I could whoop y'all. Like and so, yeah, I'm going to give you like the okay. one, yeah, I Good. know what you want. I got you. I got you. Okay, so <laughs> like the, the simple version of it is, 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 is wish, outcome, obstacle, plan, right? So the, like what's your wish around something? Uh, and so my wish is to, 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 to exercise, you know, three days a week. I'll use myself here as an example. You, there's also one online of me at characterlab.org, which I did a more substantive one of trying to be present for people. But anyhow, <laughs> the simple one is, is exercise. I want to exercise you know, three, three days a week. What's the outcome? Well, you know, I, I'd you know, feel better. I'd look better. I'd, you know, I'd be healthier. My wife won't be unmatched at 55 <laughs> if I have a heart attack. Like, there's all types of good outcomes, right? And you need to have that outcome. So what's the obstacle other than my laziness? Well, I mean. I got two kids, I have this job, I have, you know, where in the time, and so then you have to create the key, so you have to visualize all this, you don't do it in two minutes, but there's a visualization process, so you really see the obstacle. When's the next time you're gonna feel lazy? When's the next time, and it's fun. And then you create an if-then plan, so, you know, if I wake up at 5.30 tomorrow and don't wanna go to the gym, then I'm going to, you know, get out of bed, whatever, or, you know, you create these if-then scenarios. I'm definitely doing this and with yeah. my 15-year-old. Yeah. Seriously, uh, whoop! I'm going to yeah. be like, So now the, 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 the one minor thing you should know before Maybe you, I won't do it. you could shove it down your 15-year-old's do throat <laughs> is, like, the wish and obstacle actually have to matter to the person. So <laughs> <laughs> having, having your mom's wish and obstacle. <laughs> The wish and outcome's got to <laughs> ma matter to the person, right? So your mom's <laughs> wish and outcome for you isn't necessarily, uh, but Not you can do like a okay. Jedi mind trick, right? <laughs> you want to study in school. <laughs> so yeah, but yeah. It, it, it has to be like something that's really meaningful. But it is, it's, if you go to thecharacterlab.org, there's a bunch of stuff on it, and it's really neat. It's, it has the largest research base, a huge body of evidence behind it. And so what we're trying to do now is, how do you get teachers to do it? with mm -hmm. kids in a really simple, real, not like fake way, uh, both for out, you know, things that are personally meaningful to kids as well as you know, school-based stuff. So cool, I love that. It is really cool, but it is really hard about how to make it live in school. Yeah, and, and, and are there other cool things like that on characterlab.org? 
There, I mean, there are a bunch of cool stuff. There's talks for teachers on the on the website. There's the character growth card. Uh, there's an app now that allows teachers and kids to 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 use the character skills and strengths that we've identified. Uh, to actually give sort of formative feedback, and then you can do it on, 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 on your iPhone or iPad or on paper, uh, and it allows you to really engage in sort of like this meaningful uh, back and forth uh, with parent, kids and parents uh, as well. Because here's the interesting thing about the character growth card, because there's, you know, people are like, well, it seems like, you know, I don't want to know if I want to give a kid a number on their grit or self-control. Well, a couple of things. One, in the United States, Almost every elementary school and middle school has some type of conduct grade. And when you think about conduct, it's really like a singular measure that really means compliance, which really means are, do you sit down and shut up, right? Which is like the least like, holistic way of viewing a person on the planet. And so the character growth card takes one measure, blows it out to seven measures, and parents want to know if their kid's gritty, want to know if their kid has social intelligence, curious, or self-control, or, or the, 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 the strengths of the, uh, on the character growth card. And it forces teachers. So like teachers, zest is one of the strengths on the character growth card. And teachers don't often look at zest as a strength, but it is a strength, and it's so important for kids. And so th it's really breathed life in, into schools, and we're excited to, gain, to see it start to gain more traction, and we think with an app, it can be available to people all over the world, which would be great for Teach for All and, and all the different networks out there because engaging in, these, in, the, in the conversation is a big part of how kids become self-aware of that stuff. Mm -hmm. I'm going to start asking some of these questions all right. that I'm getting. But, um, so Aditya Valetti is asking, do you track your character work's effect on academics? Yes. Um, Yes, uh, and so there's a, a, a paper that Angela published uh, that is available on the characterlab.org website that basically shows that there's, you know, the character strengths and skills, they, they cluster in three general areas, uh, and not surprisingly, grit and self-control you know control are related to things like GPA, you know, te standardized test scores, achievement, others are related to attendance, you know, uh, you know so there's actually, uh, some of the strengths are related to uh, kids' feelings of optimism and, uh, and happiness. So it's, it's related to academics as well as non-academics. But yes, the, 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 you know, Angela's research on grit has been shown to have effects on like spelling bees, West Point. I mean, like, not surprisingly to anyone who's worked with kids, you know, yeah. grit and self-control are huge determinants of academic outcomes. Yeah. Surprisingly, curiosity is not totally linked to academic outcomes. Uh, it is linked to all types of good life outcomes, but it is not necessarily tied to GPA, which was really a bummer for me, because I was like, come on, it's got to be. No, it's not. Yet, so. Um, now, before we, I mean, p people should keep sending yeah. in their questions yep. and such, but what, I got else, a lot here. It's, what it's else are you, oh, you're watching, you're looking at questions, yeah. yeah. Let us know if there's some in there I you want to answer. But I want to know what else you're working on. Like, tell us, like, what else, like, you know, you, Dave just told me before this that he's still spending 90% of his time at KIPP, like trying to help make the schools stronger. Yeah. Like, what are the biggest things you're you're focused on? Yeah. So, I mean, I think the for us at KIPP, um, so we've had tremendous early successes. We, I mean, you know, this idea of, you know, uh, almost 50% of our original alums now have a four-year degree. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's it it, it it's it's it, we've had some tremendous early successes. Um, and at the same time, we know we can do better with the kids who are in our, in our schools today. And so we're spending a lot of time with our schools thinking about, you know, what is the instructional design behind our schools? So what are the methods our teachers are using? How much time are we allocating to those methods? Are we using curriculum and assessment materials? I mean, yeah, sure, the Align to Common Core is what everyone's talking about now, but really that is going to get our kids college ready. Mm -hmm. And then are our schools structured in a way that we have the enabling systems to drive that? So like, are we using data well? Are we using content team? Do our teachers have enough time in the day to actually study lessons, look at the student work, plan together? Uh, and that's work we hadn't done as much as we could have uh, in, the, in, the, in the first set of years as we were opening schools uh, across the country, which we really are now uh, doubling down on. We're also trying to, you know, now that we have K, 
you know, 12 and seeing the kids all the way through, we, we, this character work is really important because when you look at the kids who have the academic skills, for, so like the academic skills, I know we spent a bunch of time on the character skills, but the academic skills are like the single like biggest thing kids, like getting kids at the right academic skills makes a huge difference to their life outcomes because it, all types of opportunities, both career-wise, college-wise, open up. But we have tons of kids who are academically prepared who then get to college and there are all types of other challenges where these character skills are as important and they're real life challenges uh, that happen. Um, and so uh, how do we help our kids do that? And then uh, kids who get degrees still, how do you figure out what job and how do we figure out that? And we're gonna have 40,000. I mean, I know it's like small potatoes compared to TFA and Teach yeah. for All. Like, uh, you got like a billion people, you know, whatever. But it's, I get it. Uh, but 40,000 is a big number to us. Uh, we have, we're going to have 40,000 college-age alums at 2020, yeah. right? And so what do all those kids do to then help other uh, have, have those opportunities? So I'm spending a bunch of time on that. Uh, I helped co-found. The, the only other thing I, I did, um, as if that wasn't a lot, my mom doesn't still understand what I do. She's like, <laughs> she'll call me. She's like, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm at work. Oh, you have a job. Yeah, I do. Uh, so <laughs> the... the uh, I helped uh, Norman Atkins, uh, you know, who, who I, uh, was one of the co-founders of Relay, which is a graduate school that we started. We also started Zern, which is a digital learning organization uh, that's working on creating a K-8 uh, digital, uh, K-8 math, starting with math, we'll explain it elsewhere, but uh, K-8 uh, digital math uh, program. And it's, it's really starting to pick up steam. We're working in uh, Denver and others, and, and, and so that's going to be out next year for grades two through two through five. Uh, and then we also ended up sort of tinkering and come up with this really fun game called Impoppable, which is, uh, you know, an iOS game. And it's, you know, people are starting to download it for multiplication and division facts. And like, I was surprised because we sort of did it as like a, it was like a game challenge to break up a, a day of meetings. And it turned out to be something that people are loving. And so, so cool. yeah. I'll tweet that out later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's really, I, I'm, I'm surprised uh, at the, not surprised, but it's like the number of kids and teachers who are like, wow, you know, for, for just basic fluency that kids need. It's really, uh, that game's been great. And, and what are you coming to think about instruction? Like as you get out there and try to figure out how do we raise the rigor bar and all yeah. of that, I mean, it used to be that, I think I heard you say, it's like, y you know, you weren't loyal to one instructional methodology yeah. versus another. But h how has that evolved? You know, it, it, no, it, it, I'm still, I, I'm, um, I mean, yeah, I'm not, I still don't think it's about one method or methodology. Uh, I think at the end of the day, the key is what we talked about all those years ago, right? Like, how much of the heavy lifting are kids doing? how much sustained heavy lifting are the kids doing? And how much independent practice do kids get? Uh, it's amazing if you just track the amount of time that kids spend either not engaged or engaged on low level activities or listening to the teacher do all the talking. Uh, it, kids are doing a fraction of the, of the actual work. So we're trying to make sure that in all of our classrooms, you know, a third or more of the, of the time is being spent by the kids doing independent work. Um, so that's one. And then the other thing that I've sort of become convinced of uh, is that the amount of individual academic feedback that kids get uh, from their academic teacher uh, is a key, key factor in driving outcomes. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I think there's so much promise in how tutors can play hands in that of freeing up time. I think obviously technology has a big promise in that. But when you look at all of the, this actually came out of the character work because mm -hmm. when you look at all of the deliberate practice research about what leads to like world-class performance. It's one-on-one -on -one feedback from a coach who is a subject matter expert in the thing. So violin coaches don't have golf, people who are experts at golf teaching them how to play the violin, right? And so they have a, someone who's an expert at the violin giving them feedback that notes off. And so if you want to get academic feedback on math, you really need someone who understands. Now obviously on the elementary level it's easier because you have one person yeah. teaching all, but like you need to have that time uh, and so I think the more independent work kids are doing, but rigorous work, uh, and then this idea of how much independent individual f mm. feedback they get from their academic teacher mm. uh, is, is really a big deal. And, and what have you come to think, or, or what has that led you to think about the balance? Like what role 
technology can play in yeah. accelerating as we progress, look at our in the middle of our conversation we're like looking at our you know <laughs> uh, so I mean I think so I, I'm up I, I, I am a big fan of technology I'm a big fan of how we're using it in our schools I mean KIPP schools are using it in a bunch of different ways uh, I think the the obvious ways are a it allows you to differentiate uh, instruction for you know all the kids in the class and then B uh, I think what people, so that everyone sort of, mm. yeah, we get that, that's the idea. Although, by the way, one of the reasons we started to learn is because like, there's a lot of stuff out there right now that will teach you if you will learn sort of by the traditional sort of just sit and lit, like, like if a teacher tells you this, you know, yeah. and you'll learn it, there's stuff out there like that. But if you're not the type of person who's just going to learn it that way, there's still it is, is not, it's, it's a growing field, but there's a long way to go before technology replaces what teachers do. Yeah. Um, but what I'm most excited about is the this, this second thing I talked about, is like teachers' ability to give one-on-one -on -one academic feedback to kids can be directly tied to the effective use of technology in the classroom in two ways. One, by differentiating, teachers have more time, instead of having to present to the whole class, they're able to work with small groups and individual kids, and two, the data that they're getting from the technology that they're using can give much more targeted, uh, a much more targeted sense of where kids need, uh, you know, academic uh, pushes. Yeah. Um, now, how has having your own kids changed, if anything? I mean, has it changed anything? Oh, yeah. Having your own kids? Yeah. Other than, so I, I, yeah. <laughs> uh, other exhaustion. than made me more tired. Um, <laughs> so, I have two sons, one who, as he reminded me today, is 15 days away from his sixth birthday, uh, yes, that's incredible. and the other who just turned four, who's almost as tall as a six-year-old. Uh, and I think it has convinced me of a couple of things. One, uh, it has convinced me of the importance, so if you look at, m like, like Walter Michelle's research on sort of uh, self-regulation, psychological distancing, the famous marshmallow test, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Almost all the research on a lot of this stuff talks about the importance of zero to four and zero to five, the attachment work. So like, but schools, we basically, mm -hmm. we as a country, the United States as a country, don't do a ton during those years to set, uh, in a structured way, to set kids up for later success. And so when you look at sort of uh, Carol Dweck's research on growth mindset, which we're doing a lot of work with at the Character Lab, and you think about the way we explain things to kids, uh, how much of a fixed mindset we have. So my older son uh, happens to be a, you know, he's very musical, very good dancer, et cetera. He takes after my wife in all of those regards. Um, but if you tell him he's such a good dancer, what do you think he does? He stops. Yeah. Right? And, 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 but if you say, that was a neat move, like, show me another move, or that was neat, or like, if you think about the specifics of it, or the process of it, he'll go on forever. Yeah. And like, in there is like all of, you know, Carol's research on growth yeah. mindset, right? And so, how we talk about yet, and like, you know, it's like, my, my son, can, he's almost, we're one step away from being totally uh, independent, like tying his shoes is the last hurdle. Right, he can wipe his tush, he can do all this stuff. <laughs> if you have kids, you'll understand that these things matter a ton, right? <laughs> uh, but, you know, he's learned, because we basically use it, it's like, we're attached to the word yet at the end of all the things he can't do. I can't tie my shoes, yet. I can't do this, yet. It's all growth mindset, and yet, mm. without that research, I think so much yeah. of what I would have done was like a lot more fixed mindset. It's changed my yeah. mind on that. Another thing I've done is like, our expectations for kids are too low, in general, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I, when I think about our, you know, expectations for what four and five-year-olds can do uh, are just too low. Uh, as, you know, I, my, my, four, my younger kid was in a production of Alice in Wonderland. And he can't read, and yet he had speaking lines. That he, and he learned all these songs. And I'm like, wow. Like, he was just at this high level. And then the, the final thing, uh, the other thing I've learned is like, A, which I knew, but it's even clearer, and our elementary schools have a ton of play, but like mm -hmm. you need a ton of play in school. Uh, and then the, I also, the importance of sleep, I didn't understand at all prior to having kids. And when I think about mm -hmm. some of the challenge, when I watch, you know, the bedtimes of our, of, of, like, and those are directly tied to resources, mm -hmm. right? 
I mean, it, it, keeping a regular bedtime schedule is really hard, but when I think about the challenges of kids growing up in low-income neighborhoods in this country uh, with, you know, mm. with all of the different challenges that family faces, if you don't get enough sleep, the impact is so dramatic. And I think about what happens to kids in schools, and I think about why are so many kids labeled behavior problems, like in kindergarten, and it started to realize, like, a lot of it is they're just tired. Mm. And so, like, ha I would not have known that without having kids because I see my own boys, when they're, when they're well rested, yeah. people think they're angels. Yeah. And when they're not, they're like, could you leave the restaurant, so right? And yeah. it's like, so yeah, I didn't true. understand that at all. Um, Stephen Farr is asking, how has your understanding of how to grow great teachers changed over time? Like, what teacher development takes? Yeah, so, I mean, Stephen should come out and give the answer to this, shouldn't he? It's like, this you know. This is our biggest dilemma right, right so, now, Right, so, I mean, I, I think the, so, uh, I was blessed. So, it's taken me, basically, my entire career to be convinced that the way Harriet trained me is actually hmm. largely the best way to train a bunch of things. So, I think there are three, there are uh, three things. Number one, teachers need to actually take the time to study, to do the intellectual work around what am I teaching? Kindergarten, mm -hmm. te like what's the meat of this? Kindergarten through 12th grade, like what is the actual main point that kids need to understand? How am I gonna get it to them? So there's intellectual prep mm -hmm. that teachers need. Uh, number two, they need time to compare those things with other teachers. So that's like the whole Japanese lesson study thing. Mm -hmm. Um, all of which Harriet and I did together. Uh, we don't do that uh, well, mm -hmm. right? So as a country, we don't, teachers aren't striving. And then three, uh, in terms of the actual delivery of it, teachers need feedback in real time. And the way any other person who is basically performing anything gets, right? And so, uh, you know, Harriet would stop me in the middle of the lesson and say, no, you didn't ask the right question, or you didn't do this, or you didn't do that, or this person's not listening, or you didn't turn your body this way, or look, the kid didn't get it, got to go, you know, and all of this, in the middle of the class, right? And it was embarrassing and all this other stuff, but the, but the embarrassment served to make me want to go better faster, because I, I just want to get through Harriet not talking. Please don't talk, right? Uh, and it, you know, about, Three months in, I get, went through a lesson where she didn't talk. And like, that was like this moment of like, my first year where I was like, oh, I could do this job. And, you know, but that is not sort of institutionalized right now. Uh, so I think those three things. And then finally, what we've learned at Relay uh, is teachers need lots and lots of practice. They just need a lot of actual deliberate practice where they get that feedback before they go in uh, and actually teach it. Mm -hmm. So, but we're not set up as a country to do those things right. in a systematic way. I mean, that's the big Let alone, question, yeah. right? Like, do you think we can actually develop great teachers outside of the context of great schools? Like, why don't, I mean, do you think uh, it's possible? Uh, so yeah, I think, I think, yes, I think there, I think. Not even saying like, but outside of the context of schools, let me just say, like, do you think that this whole structure of pre-service training no, I mean the, the great thing about Relay is Relay is this graduate school that that uh, we started. Uh, Norman Atkins from Uncommon, Dacian Toto from Achievement First, and I started a bunch of years ago, uh, which is now serving 1,200 teachers and 200 principals, and in, in I think six different cities, and it's really incredible. But everybody is in their first couple of years of teaching. Uh, so I don't think this idea of like you train before you ever, there, I think there's a st set of stuff that you could start training kids in college, mm. uh, or you could do, like, I think there what is think a body. What do you think that stuff is? So I think there, you can start training on some of the pedagogy, you can start learning the content, you can start understanding basic classroom methods. So I think you can get a lot of that stuff, you can start to understand sort of the, some of this character work, but until you're in it, you can't, the, you can't get all of it to connect, mm -hmm. right? So even if you learned some of it before, you, got, you can't learn all, you, even if you did some before, you'd still need some during it to understand how it works, how it's applied. Yeah. Uh, and then obviously if you work in a great school, your school does a lot of that development alongside. So I think a great graduate school of education uh, combined to a great school, you can get great teachers, mm -hmm. right? If you have a great graduate school without a great school, 
Uh, I think you can get great teachers, but it's, it, it's harder. Yeah. Um, Becca Ships uh, at Teach for All is asking, how are you measuring impact once kids leave KIPP schools? And what has changed over time about that? Yeah, so uh, the number one way we're measuring impact, obviously, is uh, college completion and career, what careers kids go off to do. So we, we're in touch with 100% of our kids, so we're tracking them to and through college. The kids who don't go to college, what are they doing? Uh, so those are sort of the major, major ways. We are just now starting to think about getting more uh, strategic and scientific about measuring life satisfaction and, and the things that matter as well. But in our first, you know, uh, you know, in our first 20 years, uh, the, you know, the focus so far is getting kids to and through uh, college and career. So uh, for the kids who aren't going to college, um, you know, our view is that the skills for college should be for everyone, even if kids at the end of the day choose not to go or there are other circumstances. We don't want it to be because they're not prepared. You know, and that, that I think is a big deal. People can argue all they want. Mm -hmm. Should kids go to college? I, I, I think there are real reasons that it may not be right for an individual kid. Yeah. The thing I'm not willing to do is to tell it to an eight-year-old. And the thing I'm not willing to do is not let it be that kid's individual choice because they're unprepared, mm -hmm. right? So if a kid should have those skills and then make the choice when they're 17. I was on a call the other day with One World, which is, is the network of kind of KIPP-inspired schools around the world, um, some of them led by Teach for All program alums. But the, this group of people who are some of the school leaders in Mexico were essentially asking the, the board of One World for their help and feedback on what their ultimate measures of success should be. Mm -hmm. And one idea they threw out, which I thought was kind of intriguing, was um, I mean, these are their internal measures, yeah. right? Was to measure income, like student mm -hmm. income, like yeah. ultimately. Are you all measuring that? What Not do you think yet. about that idea? Not yet. I think it's a good idea. I mean, I think, so if you think about Kip's mission, uh, it's to prepare kids with the character and academic skills for uh, success. And, and happiness, I mean, it's not quite success and happiness, but it's mm. success and happiness in college, career, and life, mm -hmm. right? And so I think when you think about those measures uh, for, and the self-sufficiency is in there, right? So self-sufficiency mm. is directly tied. I mean, we can dance around it all you want, but self-sufficiently in some level is tied to income. Mm. And so I think having income be a, you know, a, a not the entire measure, but part of measurement of success of, of, mm. of of a school program, I think is, is important actually. Um, you know, why do people, you know, you go into almost any school and you see like, you know, a basic poster of like kids with a college degree earn this and kids with a GED and no, you know, because they're trying to make that connection, although it doesn't necessarily connect for most, yeah. you know, posters aren't gonna change the world. Um, but I think, I, I think income's important. Yeah. I mean, you could have income, you could, I mean, it's the same thing that, you know, uh, the UK is trying to figure out, or other countries are trying to figure out, is how do you measure beyond GDP the health of a society, yeah. right? So, like, you can measure flourishing, you can measure income, you can measure, obviously, the stuff like, you know, uh, incarceration yeah. rates or teen, pre like, there are all types of things that you could add I mean, I to a holistic wonder, measure. I do wonder, what do you think about putting energy into developing that measure? Like, when we think about what are our ultimate outcomes for kids, I feel like it could re-gear, I mean, I don't know, do, how important do you think that could be in the scheme of things in terms of ensuring that all of the work, I mean, either within KIPP or even thinking about within communities around yeah. the world, let alone around the country here, you know, it feels like it could reorient our teachers in a really important way to really get centered in what are we ultimately aiming at? Yes. Are you all working on that? No. What do you think about working on it? It's good. It's good. I mean, we have a lot going on, right? So the, the, the measure, I mean, we, yeah. we're talking about it. So I do think it is, so we're in our schools right now, part of the character work has led to this definition of what we're aiming for around PERMA, which is Dr. Seligman's definition of flourishing. Mm. And it stands for positive emotions. So like when you think about happiness, right, it's not actually happiness. Like positive emotions is what we typically think of as happiness, mm -hmm. but PERMA flourishing is different than happiness. So PERMA is positive emotions, engagement, relationships, meaning, and accomplishment. And accomplishment is a significant part of flourishing. And when you break down, when you start teasing out what accomplishment means, well, then you have academic outcomes, you have college completion, mm -hmm. you have income, 
you have career attainment, those are mm -hmm. accomplishments and those matter. But then you have to think about civic engagement, you have to think about those other measures. So PERMA uh, and, and Seligman and others are actually working on these life, like these societal measures mm -hmm. that include income, go beyond income. Uh, and so, yeah, I think I, I would love us to We've see. We've got to get Warren and, Seligman in here for a Teach for All talk. So that yes. will be our next stop. Yeah. Love that. And so, but I mean, I think that the more we think broader yeah. with the one thing, as long as no one uses it uh, to, uh, to, as long as no one uses it to water down the expectations we have for kids. To say, oh, it's okay, this kid can't do X because they're a really nice person. Yeah. Because it's just unfair to kids, right? Kids can do whatever. It's not the kids' fault. It is our, as the adults, responsibility to get this right for them. Yeah. Okay. Let me get a few more questions yeah. in here and a couple last ones of my own. Okay. Phil McComb, I should teach for all, is asking, are there things, are there schools that do things differently from KIPP that are getting great results that you're learning from? Yeah. I mean, we're learning a lot from a lot of different people. Uh, we've looked at Obviously, the success schools here in New York City, we spent a bunch of time. Obviously, we've been longtime partners with Uncommon and Achievement First. We've learned a lot of time. We've learned from uh, the, you know, Edward Brooke Charter Schools up in Boston. We've learned from a lot of the, the private schools around New York that we've gone to visit. We're always no. looking. We learned from our you know, Yes in Houston, where we're partnered with. Noble yeah. Street's been a big impact on sort of how we think about high schools. So what have you learned from success? So I mean, I think one of the things we've learned from success is there. I mean, there are a bunch success of different things. Success is a charter network for all those people around the world. It's not like what have you learned from success, right? But, um, it's a name yeah. of a yeah. I mean, I think just how ex their their explicit level of what how explicit they're thinking about their teacher training mm. and the type of uh, the way in which their people spend their time. I think is, is around academic, drive, in order to drive the academic rigor, I think has been a, a, a really big takeaway. Interesting. How are they spending their time? I mean, I think they, they are spending more of their time studying the lessons, looking at the student work, mm -hmm. giving that type of feedback. What I described as yeah. that arc, I think success is doing yeah. more of that. I think Uncommon is doing more of that. Those are some of the things we've learned. I think uh, one of the things we took from, I took from my visit to the Edward Brooke school up in, in Massachusetts is they are, uh, of all the schools I've seen, they do uh, the best job mm -hmm. of finding time for teachers to meet one-on-one -on -one with kids mm -hmm. by the way they've structured their school and that idea of academic mm -hmm. free feedback I, I talked about. Yeah, uh, interesting. Yeah. And, and what about, I'm curious what you've gotten from visiting the private schools. Yeah, so I mean I think the, the, the biggest thing, uh, one of the biggest things that I've, I've gotten from visiting the private schools uh, is the way they use play. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, the, in, in some respects, they are, they, they, the, the, their elementary school, they have such a different model than, than most public schools and public charter schools because of the, you know, uh, different skill levels mm -hmm. of the entering kids. So like, they don't feel the urgency that we feel to get kids reading in kindergarten. Mm -hmm. Because they know that all of that is, com a, they, I mean, they feel a lot of urgency. But they know kindergarten, first grade, the parents, you know, it's all happening, you know. Mm -hmm. And so there's a ton of imaginative play. There's a ton of these things, even at the most structured of the private school. I'm not talking about like the, yeah. you know, the totally le most progressive where like, you know, there are no walls or any of this stuff. I'm talking about like a very structured, yeah. very traditional private schools have a much higher ratio of play uh, in the early grades mm -hmm. than, uh, any public school, any charter yeah. school that I've, I've ever seen. Uh, and so I think thinking about that has been uh, one of a, a really big uh, sort of takeaway. Yeah. And you don't feel, I mean, that's what I was actually curious about when asking about, like, now that you're starting with three year olds, has that changed in terms of, like, do you feel the flexibility to build? Yeah, more we have, of that I, mean, we, I think one of the things we've always had is, I mean, I think one of the things that's been the hallmark of KIPP from the beginning is this combination of joy and rigor. I mean, mm -hmm. I think anyone who comes to KIPP schools uh, just notices mm -hmm. uh, about our joy. I mean, it's just yeah. been there from, from the beginning. Um, and so uh, I think we've always tried to be playful and always had play. We've been intentional with our, in, in our kindergarten, our, our elementary schools and our preschools have a lot of play. Yeah. And then we learned a lot of that from the private schools. Yeah. Um, Interesting. And, but it, 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 I think it eases it 
Uh, but it is a, it is a, uh, it is still, I mean, you start even with three, you can see the impact of the level of prep kids are coming in with. I mean, that, that gap that people talk about, the opportunity gap, starts right away, yeah. which is why I think what we do with new, n how we think about helping new parents get their kids set up for success would be, you know, you, know, yeah. you, you see that whole measles outbreak thing and we're talking about vaccine. I mean, yeah. by and large, most people in this country are vaccinated. Yeah. It's a big push, but we don't vaccinate our kids for academic, for, for, for these other things. And we so could. True. There are That's things we so could do true. to set kids up. That? Slowly, <laughs> slowly. That, that the character lab, yeah. There are thing. some things that uh, people are, there are a lot of people starting to really focus on the, on the zero to five space yeah. and the, 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 so the new great. mom. Okay, quick answer to this so that I can get to my last two questions. Sure. Uh, Javier is asking, what tech innovations in character development or education more generally are most exciting to you? Any off the top beyond the ones that you Beyond have. Zern and Impopable, which people should go download. Yeah. Uh, uh, tech innovations around the character stuff. I don't think there's, <laughs> uh, I think the, the MOOC around, the, I think some of these just online courses and getting it out there is really inspiring in the character stuff and just get that in the hands. I don't think there's been that much uh, tech innovations on that. Mm. The tech innovations in school is, is I think the, the way in which teachers, there's not an individual program. I mean, you can go through all the big names. You can talk about you know, Khan Academy. You can talk about ST Math. You could talk about uh, any of the things that are happening, uh, uh, Accelerator Reader, or the things that people know about. It is that you now, it's no longer the, it is now uh, you're walking into, I would say it's no longer the exception. I'm not gonna say it's the majority of classrooms yet I walk into and see it done, but I'm no longer surprised at the biggest thing I'm excited about is that you see more and more teachers experimenting with the rotational model. You see more and more teachers using technology to differentiate instruction, but also to allow them more time to work one-on-one -on -one with kids. Yeah. And so I don't think there's yet sort of a single software answer, but the method itself mm -hmm. is, is, if not in the majority, certainly pretty close now to almost half the classrooms I go into. Yeah, cool. Which is really exciting. So stepping back just for these last uh, few minutes, yeah. I mean, we may only get to one of these, which is okay. But um, I mean, this has been such a journey over how many years, almost 25 years? It's been a long time. Almost. It's been um, a long time. And I'm just curious, like just thinking personally, I mean, what advice would you give yourself when you were 21? You're just starting out. Oh, to, oh I was talking about to myself now. I was like, okay, <laughs> go to the gym. Uh, <laughs> No, I mean, the, or what are the biggest so the ones? biggest thing, I, I was blessed. Um, you know, I, we, we joked about my advisor telling me I didn't know anything. Um, but that was such good advice. It, it was We're really good advice. still trying to convince all those college yeah. students out but there it, around the world to go advice. To, but I, I think here's the thing, right? People always ask me about, like, the things people want to talk to me about are actually not the things that people, in my view, should want to talk to me about. Uh, because the, the single thing, I mean, we talked a lot about the stuff that I think is important, like instructional rigor. Like, so no one should ask me about starting a, a, a nonprofit. No one should ask me about starting a social, it being a social entrepreneur, whatever these things they want to talk. They should ask me about how do I become the best possible teacher on the planet? Because that's, like, that's, that's the only thing that I really am, like, what I obsess about is teaching and running a school. Yeah. And so, like at 21, I think everything else, all of Kip's growth has come out of that obsession and the constant, like, how do I get better at this one thing? Mm -hmm. Teaching and then ultimately being a principal. Yeah. Um, you know, and so if I was 21 and I wanted to become great in this field, it starts with becoming a great teacher. Mm -hmm. And like, great at the thing leads to all these other things. People don't like that. You know, the, 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 the person you introduced me to who's running all those, the orchestras in, in, yeah. in Latin America, they started with one yeah. and got great at that and then figured out how to, you know, constantly yeah. ask. So I think that is the biggest thing uh, that people miss. Yeah. And, and what if we did ask you that question? How mm. do I become the greatest teacher? Like, what's your advice on that front? Yeah, I mean, so, I mean, I think the, I think it is, um, 
So I think it is the three things I talked about. So you, you have to study the material. Like I spent hours and hours trying to figure out how to teach fractions. Like I was constantly twirling this and thinking about this and studying how other people did it. And this was pre-internet, right? So I yeah. couldn't go online and it was weird, right? It was like the, and so I, I'd have to find people. So like study, be ruthless with this, like the bar has to be ridiculously high, right? So when, when I was teaching, I didn't look at, I was constantly asking, what did the best kid do in my class? Where was the gap? And then tried to find the best kid in my class and compare them to the best kid I could find on the planet. And now it's easier on the, what, but like, ha, like that, look at their work and what's the gap and what are you gonna do to move them? And then you have to find someone who's gonna give you that like, really deliberate feedback on the actual craft. And you have, to, you have to accept it, right? And so like, you know, it's like just accept it and then figure it out. So that I think is the, the key, um, but it was all I did. I lived and breathed every summer, every minute, you know, I was thinking and twirling and like I'd be out at night and writing things on like a napkin and like, it was like all I could, you know, it, people, it was all I could think about. Yeah. You remember those days, like people were like, stop. Like, I it was have like, to ask you one more question. Yeah. I know I shouldn't, but uh, last question. So like, because I listened to you talk about the standards that you've got to have for yeah. yourself. So how, do you, how are you thinking about sustainability? And, and how do you, do you? It's like 20 some odd years. Like I'm, like, how do you think, even not, not for yourself, but think about, I mean, you cannot tell me that at KIPP this isn't an ongoing conversation. Like, we expect so much of ourselves, we expect so much of each other. I mean, maybe KIPP has figured this out, which would be awesome. Please share with no. Teach for All. How do you have incredibly high standards for yourself and feel really great all the time about oh. the sustainability of your life? Who said that? Well, this is good. Right? Please I mean, share. no, Please it's not about feeling great about this, <laughs> but it is. It's changing. So, like, first of all, this idea of, like, like when people come to me and say, I want, like, I want more balance, you know, like, I'm like, that's like a science instrument, right? Like, it's a balance, right? You put things on a balance, right? Like, in my mind, what I, what I want is fulfillment in life, right? I want to flourish. I want Seligman's definition of flourishing. Uh, and that means I want, I want the positive emotions, I want the engagement, I want the relationship, I want the meaning, and I want the accomplishment. And so uh, recognizing that all of these things go together uh, matter. And so you know, the thing that KIPP has become, as we've grown, we've become more sustainable. Because it's actually, it's unsustainable for an army of a few to defeat the forces that we're up against. Mm -hmm. But for an army of all, for Teach for All, for Teach for America, for all of us to unite in this is sustainable, right? And so, you know, I think, could I have done all of this? Could Mike and I have done all of this in our 20s and had the type of families we had by ourselves now and stayed married and be fought? Like, I don't know whether that all possible. Uh, can we do it now? because there's an army? And can people come in now and do it in their 20s because there's an army? Yes, and I think that's the opportunity we all have, right? Like, we didn't get here overnight. These problems weren't created in a single swell swoop. They're not gonna be ended in a swoop. They're gonna require all of us to dedicate our whole careers to it. And I think that's what's inspiring, right? And so for the, like, you know, I'm inspired. I go into our schools and I see the 20-year-olds and like, you know, I realize I'm no longer 20 and I don't look it, but like to see that everyone can play a, a role in that, yeah. I think is, is, is why it's sustainable and why I'm actually optimistic. And when you look at Teach for All, you know, like I do actually think that we can change the world it's in true. our lifetimes. And you're making a huge contribution to oh, progress well, all you. over the world, thank believe you. it or not. So thank through you. your example. Yay. So thank you, Dave. Thanks for... All the good, good thoughts.